Welcome to another Ag Gateway Global Network video. I'm Jim Wilson, President of Ag Gateway Global Network, and with me is Stuart Ray from Ag Connections. Stuart will discuss ADAPT data model identifiers. Stuart, please tell us what you do for Ag Connections and Ag Gateway, and then move into your presentation. My name is Stuart Ray. As Jim said, I work for Ag Connections, which is a farm management software company in Murray, Kentucky. I also happen to be the vice chair of the ADAPT Technical Committee and in charge of its data model. So let's get started. Before we begin, a little expectation management. Our topic today is identifiers inside the ADAPT model. So that is the scope at which we're going to be looking at. There will be other webinars that cover other topics more in depth, but for today we're going to restrict ourselves to discussing identifiers. This is very much a work in progress. We are doing our best to bring this along. This has been a total project, I guess, of about five years at this point. DAPT itself has been around for, in one form or another for close to two years, and it is, as I said, a work in progress. We need your help because we've carried this about as far as we can with the core group that's been working on it, and we're interested in getting other people's input on it. That's the main reason why ADAPT has really been commissioned as an open source project. So we need your input. The general topics that we'll be looking at today really revolve around how the identifiers and ADAPT, how the we settled on the system that we settled on, what you can expect to see in there, uh, how you can expect them to work, and give you a little insight into why. With that, we'll get into our slides. You know, one of the first things we did in working up this common object model was to get this core group of people that's actually a pretty wide cross-section of subject matter experts in the industry. So people from equipment OEMs, software companies, even some crop input companies showed up at the table, data models in hand, to start hashing out what this common object model that's really the core of ADAPT was going to look like. And one of the first things that we had to come to terms with is how to identify things. And it was one of the first fundamental incompatibilities that we came across. What we ended up seeing, because of the diversity of people that were there, was we ended up kind of getting a picture of the state of the current practices in the industry for identifying things. The first thing we came across was that people use different types of identifiers. In one case, one group was using simple integers. So it, I think it ended up actually being the row number on the data table that they were using. So every time you added something to the controlled vocabulary, which was the list of things you were trying to identify, you know, it automatically received that next row number. Yet another group had strings as their identifier. So, you know, from something like a crop protection perspective, right, typing in Roundup into the controller was good enough. That's how, you know, that product in that particular usage was uniquely identified. It was by the string that the user had assigned it. Still other companies, Ad Connections being one of them, use GUIDs or universally unique identifiers. So this is an alphanumeric sequence of 32 characters delimited by dashes and is fairly guaranteed to be unique depending on how they're generated. And although there was not a group actually using URIs right now as a unique identifier. It was something that we were aware of from earlier SPADE project looking at reference data and how to supply reference data. So the idea was kind of already in play of using URIs as uniquely identifying a resource. The interesting thing was that it was not just different identifier types but it was also, we were each kind of scoping our identifiers differently. You know, in one instance, it was good enough to know that you were talking about a product, and that product, you know, the first product that you used was product one, and the next product you used was product two, and the third product you used was product three. And just knowing that the object you were talking about was a product, and then the ID was one, was good enough to guarantee some form of uniqueness. 
Still others had the process of assigning an identifier in a local scope. So the particular data card that you were using had a collection of farms or a collection of fields or a collection of products on it. And for the purposes of all the data that was collected on that card, each one of those had a identifier. Again, oftentimes it was a sequential integer that was good enough. You know, So the grower might be ID1, and then the first farm was ID2, and the first field under that farm was ID3. And then you just went through and you numbered these things as you were putting them into the card. And then you had that it was guaranteed to be unique only in the scope of that data card. And then the third category was globally unique. So you had certain companies that were using identifiers for objects that they assured, you know, they were assured were globally unique, regardless of whether it was on this data card or another data card that you made or a collection of data that you were wanting to share with somebody. You know, every identifier in there was guaranteed to be unique and it was reused in a global frame. We also uncovered that there were different classes of data that we were dealing with and that we had to take into consideration when we were choosing how to identify things. First of all was reference data and this is a class of data that bear with me here because this may be splitting some hairs and there's a certain level of nuance to these things that you may need to chew on for a while until it really becomes clear to you. The first category that we came upon was reference data. And what we mean by reference data are the universal idea for a universal instance of something. So if you want to talk about a particular crop protection product, okay, and you want an identifier for that product, an identifier that has nothing to do with how it's packaged or how it's used or when it's used, it is a identifier that is for that product and is universal. You know, we see a couple of different categories of kinds of objects that might fall into this category. Crop protection products are certainly one of them, as well as OEM type machinery. So this particular model, uh, this particular make, and this particular model of a piece of equipment are things that could have these universal reference identifiers. When you go down the next level, however, you get into what we refer to as grower setup data. So identifiers that are unique to a particular grower an internal ID for that grower, an internal ID for his farm, his number of farms, his number of fields, things that are very specific to that grower and that aren't assumed to be kind of shared universally. This is something that might be internal to your FMIS system. So as you're assigning IDs and creating a new user, a new grower, and he's creating new farms and new fields, you're assigning these identifiers as he's creating them, and they really are scoped specifically to him. And it's probably not something that's going to be shared universally with everybody. You may exchange it with partners. You may want to exchange it with, say, your third-party applicator, be able to give him your farm field tree, and with that, as a grower, your identifiers. But it's not something that's going to be going through a universal registry, a centralized location where it's going to be held. This is something that's probably going to sit back in your FMIS and be subject to who you exchange data with. Similarly, configuration setup data applies to a specific instance of an object and how it's used. So if we back up to a second to the grower level and we say, okay, at the reference level, I have this make and model of combine. And there are certain properties that are shared by all instances of that make and model of combine. So that has an identifier, we hope, from a reference perspective. At a grower perspective, you might have that make and model of combine with serial number XYZ123. That is your, as a grower, combine. And that too could have a unique identifier. 
And then here at this third level of configuration, you might have that XYZ123 combine configured a specific way. And that configuration might need a unique identifier because it's important to preserve that configuration because it's relevant to how you interpret the data that's generated from that machine. And you may change that configuration over time. And if you do, that new configuration needs a new unique identifier so that you can attach it to the data that it's relevant and be able to interpret that data without orphaning the data that you collected before. And lastly, documentation. So that data that you're collecting as you're driving over the field or work order that you're creating, these things need unique identifiers as well. Now, there are some companies that have a unique identifier for each GPS point that is logged and as it's passing over the field. There are some companies that group chunks of data based on certain field conditions. So if you are logging data and you make a change, like you change the field that's selected on the controller, that closes one chunk of data that is assigned a unique identifier and opens another chunk of data you log data into with a, yet another unique identifier, a different one. So all of us coming together sitting down with our models. These are the things that were surfacing as we were starting to talk about identifiers, which is really kind of mind-blowing because it, it's a foundational issue and you would hope that there wasn't such fundamental incompatibility as you know we were just starting out with this, but there was and we got through it. But you know all of these discussions led to coming up with some requirements of how we were going to handle this inside ADAPT. And the first thing that I want everyone to understand is we try really hard to follow a policy of not picking winners. Okay, we didn't want to architect adapt such that it favored any one usage over another. I mean, we had this great diversity of how people were using identifiers, and we wanted to support people where they were not force them into what we thought was best as far as, you know, create some kind of straitjacket where they had to fundamentally alter their system in order to be able to make use of ADAPT. We want people to use ADAPT, okay? But at the same time, we had to have a way of encapsulating people's different ways of using identifiers and being able to exchange them. Another consideration we had was using things by reference. It's one thing to establish a unique identifier for something. Another issue is how you make use of it. So we're architecting ADAPT to accommodate exchanging data with people, and sometimes that means exchanging large quantities of data with people. So I start a relationship with a new agronomist or a new precision ag company, and I want to send them, I as a grower want to send them the last five years of my yield data. That's not small. In fact, that's going to be a pretty large chunk of data. So one of the tenets that we tried to follow was, look, we don't want to repeat a lot of stuff in this package of data. So it makes sense to use things by reference within the model. And especially if you're going to persist this to storage, you're going to, you're going to persist it to a file, or you're going to try to send it wirelessly the size starts to matter when you're working with the large volumes of data. We also came across the idea of facilitating data exchange, right? If I'm working with a third-party applicator and he has an existing FMIS system and mine happens to be different, well, we're going to be exchanging, say, the grower farm field tree so he knows the names of my fields and what the boundaries look like and that kind of thing. But, you know, his system is not guaranteed to use the same kind of identifier as mine is. So it would really be great that if in this conversation of, of exchanging data back and forth, both of our identifiers could be persisted. If I'm using a GUID to name as part of a way of identifying my field, and his system doesn't use GUIDs, it uses integers, it would be really great if we could capture both of those as attributes of the field. So you're not forced to pick one. You're not forced to support one and not the other. 
So the idea of being able to facilitate this exchange of data by supporting multiple identifiers for the same object was something that kind of emerged out of these discussions and was really powerful. So what we ended up with was this compound identifier model. And you'll see there in the center of the, this UML diagram, the compound identifier contains a reference ID, which is an integer, and then a collection of 0 to n unique IDs. So the compound identifier, this reference ID, is used, as it says, by reference. So if I have an object, say a farm or a field, and I create it in the ADAPT common object model, it's going to be created with a reference ID. And that integer is what this farm or field, how it's going to be referenced in the data, the rest of the data that the model contains. So if I make reference to this farm as part of a work order, it's going to exist in that work order as this local reference ID. You see the collection of unique IDs there, right? A unique ID has an ID a type enumeration, a source, and a source type. So let's talk about this for a second. The unique ID is how we represent, how we're going to be able to represent and support the broad spectrum of different unique identifiers everybody uses. So the ID property there, everything can be reduced to a string. Okay, if it's an integer, if it's a URI, a UUID, it can all be represented as a string. So a unique ID as its ID a string. The type enumeration tells you what that ought to be cast to if you're going to use it inside your own system or what it's coming from. So if inside your data model your IDs are integers, what you would create here, you would set the ID to the string that represents that integer, you would set your type enumeration to be a long int, and that's going to give whoever's interpreting this ID the knowledge to know, hey, I use this you know, inside my system as an integer, and here's what the string is. Here's what you would cast it to. You would cast it to an integer if you were going to use it inside our system. It was also important to be able to capture who this ID was coming from. So we added this source field that allows us to say who owns this ID, who created this ID and attached it to this object. And as well, that source representation, that source identifier, what type is that? Right now we support two different types. One is a URI, which is you know kind of self-explanatory. The other is a GLN, a global location number. So let's look very quickly at an example of what a compound identifier would look like. So Everything in ADAPT begins and ends with the application data model object. And I don't know if you can see my pointer very well here on a white background, but the application data model object is the root object of the ADAPT model. So when you integrate with ADAPT, when you're interested in exchanging data with someone, this is the object that you create and you fill with the information, the data that you want to exchange. And then you hand it to one of the plugins that ADAPT supports in order to export it. In the same fashion, this is also what a plugin hands to you when you import data through a plugin. So the application data model is the root object of ADAPT. Inside that root object, you have a catalog. And the catalog is essentially a filing cabinet. Right? It's where we put all these things that we're going to use by reference elsewhere in the data, elsewhere in documents. A catalog is what you would populate if you were going to set someone up to exchange data with you. So you're going to set up your third-party applicator with the grower farm field tree so that he could use the same boundaries and use the same names and identifiers for farms and fields that you use in your system. The catalog is where all that would go. So let's look really quickly at this example of creating a farm. You see the farm object here, and you see in the catalog you have a list. You have a collection of 0 to n farm objects, right? So this farm UML that we see here has an ID, which is a compound identifier. It has a description. 
it has a reference to the grower object that this farm is a part of or associated with. Right? So looking at the JSON to the right of the slide, you'll see that the ID that's created, it has a reference ID of 9, and then it has two separate unique IDs. One, which is a GUID, it's a, a UUID. Right? The source is FMIS Company X, and the source type is a URI. The second unique ID is just a string, FRM0001, right? And that may be the type of identifier that this fictitious retailer uses. So this is what a compound identifier looks like. This is how it's used. Now all these objects that you see in the catalog here, each one of them has a compound identifier attached to it. Again, it's used by reference inside the documents, the data that you wish to exchange. And if this sounds a little confusing, you know, hang on and stick with us. With this series of webinars, you'll learn more about documents, which is the container for data, whether it be a plan, a work order, what recommendation, or a work record. We'll learn more about those in future webinars. But for now, we're talking about identifiers, and the compound identifier is the way that a DAP chooses to identify objects. A few final thoughts. Uh, first of all, you don't have to worry about managing the compound identifier. So when you integrate with ADAPT, what you have to worry about is mapping your business objects into the ADAPT common objects. The framework is going to manage the creation of compound identifiers. So every time you create an adapt farm or you create an adapt field, that object constructor is going to create the compound identifier for you. Now you'll have to go into that compound identifier and fill in your unique identifiers. You'll attach your, let's duck back here for just a second, your unique IDs, whatever integer, string, good, whatever, you're going to attach your unique IDs to these objects. But the compound identifier itself and this reference ID is going to be created and it's going to be managed by the framework. Not picking winners. We've received some pushback about this philosophy. We've received some feedback that says, you know, no, you should restrict how people do things because some ways of doing things they consider just wrong. And when you're managing, when you're building a standard like this, and you're building it by consensus, and you're building it with the help of volunteers, being prescriptive and dictatorial about how things work isn't always a luxury you can afford. So. Yes, you know, it would be nice to be prescriptive and only have one way of doing things sometimes. But that's not the way we're choosing to build this. And to be quite honest, we're having a lot of success using this process of not picking winners, of not forcing people down one path or the other. Another thing to note, there are implementation considerations for doing all this by reference. You know, I mentioned before when we were talking about the different types of data that we found about reference data and grower setup data and configuration data. Configuration data really illustrates this point. You know, using things by reference, there is always the possibility the object you're referencing, some property of it will change. And so one of the things that you have to be really cognizant of in the implementation of ADAPT and in your use of ADAPT is really how not to orphan data by changing properties of an object that you use by reference. It may be that you have to, you know, duplicate an object a couple of times, create a couple of different instances of something, especially if you're trying to package up and share historical data. So just, you know, by way of example, and I admit it's a contrived example, but you have a historical record of an application, a work record that occurred on a field. You know, you're referencing inside that work record, the field by reference, and the field has some name. The next week you have another work record associated with that field, and you've changed the name of the field. Now do you want the change in that field's name to be reflected back in the older record or should it retain the name it had when the record was originally collected? 
it's that kind of thing that you have to be mindful of in how you're implementing ADAPT because we do do things by reference. Now, I need you to understand that ADAPT is not going to do this type of thinking for you. Okay, It really is a collection of business objects that we've all agreed on and that you're supposed to map your data into and map data out of into your own system. So it really is a version from proprietary formats into this common object model and then the power behind this common object model and the relationships among the objects in there. It doesn't do much in the way of thinking for you and processing this data. It really is a common vocabulary, a common language for us to use to talk together. So heads up on that. There's a bit of a gotcha there. Facilitating data exchange by supporting multiple unique identifiers was something that we found to be hugely important. The idea of enabling these conversations between different stakeholders, and being able to exchange data, and being able to attach these multiple unique identifiers to a single object was something we found to be really powerful. And as such, you know, we're in the process of putting together some implementation guidelines about how to use ADAPT. And one of the things that we'll be emphasizing is really being a good neighbor when you exchange data with people. Caching and preserving their IDs that they send attached to objects to you it's really going to be based on the nature of your relationship with that other party, be it another software system or what, but it's going to be a burden on you or on them to have to map their identifiers to your identifiers. And once that process is done and you've attached both identifiers to the object, it's great to persist that. It's great to keep those together and pass those along because it enriches the conversation and it makes it easier for that data to be interpreted and understood. I understand there may be you know, legitimate business reasons not to do that, but for all intents and purposes, it's, again, part of the idea of being a good neighbor and persisting those IDs and passing them on. So with that, I'll kick it back to Jim. Thank you, Stuart. Well done. And thanks to all of you who are interested in learning about Ag Gateway, its activities, and its resources. Be sure to check out other videos in the iGateway Global Network video series. Take care and goodbye.